Come down with your breeches of deer skin and jackets of brown, with your red woolen caps and your moccasins. Come to the gathering summons of trumpet and drum. Come down with your rifle. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for coming to our program today. Uh, before I start, I want to thank everyone who helped us yesterday at the Bridgewater Fire Department barbecue. It was great fun and it was a nice event. It's always good to get the whole town together, and I see many of you from yesterday here today. So thank you for coming and helping yesterday. Um, we sold a lot of raffle tickets for the Lone Star Quilt. That's in the back, and anybody here that hasn't got a ticket that would like one, they're $5 each or five tickets for $20. And the drawing is October 20th at our annual meeting, and you don't have to be present to win. We'll find you by telephone. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't really have to introduce Cassie Horner to those of us in the area because we know her from the Vermont Standard. She's an editor, publisher, and co-founder of Rutland Magazine. She has a degree in writing from Norwich University, and her roots in Vermont go back almost 200 years. Her novel, Lucy E., was based on a true story and six years of genealogical and historical research. She lives in Plymouth with her husband and two dogs? Two. Just two. Just okay. two. Or three, not two. Okay. <laughs> well, welcome, Cassie. Thank Just you. So, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I'm really excited to share Lucy with you. Um, there was a time when I didn't know her at all. I didn't know she existed didn't know even her last name. She was just lost uh, in the world out there um, until I started digging into my own family history and discovering different things about her. Um, but I will tell you right up front, that, as you may have read, that she, um, was, she was born in 1826 in Shrewsbury. Um, she almost immediately, her father moved them back into New Hampshire. She. Um, lived over there. She um, married her first cousin, which was actually pretty common back then. You knew, um, you didn't have a wide association of people and you knew your relatives, so she married her first cousin. He was not, um, he was described in one court document as indolent, so he was, you know, she was the one with the ambition, um, not him. Um, he died of cancer in 1865. And then um, she got connected up with a man named David Beatty, um, who was really not a good person at all. And this is where the crux of the story for me started to come out. Um, he was a Civil War veteran. Uh, he was an alcoholic. He was a gambler. He was abusive. And he was an arsonist. And he ended up in uh, the Concord, New Hampshire prison for 10 years. She, in the meantime, I mean, a lot of times people didn't really divorce formally. They just moved on. And <laughs> she, she did move on, and she had um, three more husbands after him. <laughs> so, so she had, had quite a, a dramatic life. Um, let's see if I can work this here. Oh, and one more thing just to sort of set the scene. Um, when I started all this research, I had never been in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, I didn't, wasn't really, I mean, I knew where it was. I grew up in Vermont, but I had never been there. And so this is the whole area up here. It was right along the Connecticut River. And so it was easy that people could go easily from state to state. Um, and this, the towns that were important for her were uh, Lunenburg, right here, just directly across the river from Lancaster, New Hampshire, and into Jefferson, where she eventually ended up. There's also Guildhall, which was an important um, part of her family life. Um, and then eventually her son moved up to Bloomfield, which is, as you can see, pretty close to the Canadian border. So where I started out uh, in thinking about my family history 
was this uh, portrait. It's about 18 by 24. And as a kid, I thought it was huge. Um, it was in a cubby hole attic, at the house where I grew up. And periodically, my mother would take things out. And that was the one of the things she took out. And I was impressed by it, but I had no idea um, what it was. I did some research on it and discovered that this is uh, George Gage. He's my uh, great grandfather. Um, and he, um, I call him Civil War George because there were other <laughs> George Gages in the family. He was born in 1832 in Newberry, Vermont. He enlisted during the Civil War um, out of Guildhall when he was 30 years old. Um, he eventually came with his wife, Myelina, with my grandmother, with some of the other children, to Woodstock um, from New Hampshire in 1887. Um, my grandmother always told the story about she was four years old and she remembered coming in on the train from White River um, and one of her brothers who worked on the railroad um, saw her in the window and tossed her an orange and she always told that story. Um, he was much older than she was and she really idolized him. Um, they lived in Woodstock. Um, I'm not really clear um, what he did. Um, he died in 1900 in Woodstock and he's buried in the Riverside Cemetery in Woodstock which is right near the White Cottage. And if you notice this was like a charcoal rendering and it was based on um, this tintype which I found and this is much bigger of course than the actual tintype but I found it in some things that my grandmother had um, and I believe he I don't know if he wore it or if he it has a hole in it um, and on the back of it is scratched myelina his wife's name was scratched on the back of that this um, is a little note that was sent to my mother by her cousin Mary. Mary was the ancestor who had the, the portrait, the big portrait of George. She got elderly. She had to move to Claremont near her daughter. She didn't think her daughter would take good care of these things. And so she called my mother and asked my mother to come um, and get the picture. And that was in 1967. And she talks a little bit about if you know how I hated to part with them. So it was that picture and one of Myelina as well, that those meant a lot to her, that they, she had a really strong connection to them. But she did give them up. Um, this is George Gage's grave um, in Riverside. Then if you move from that 1960 period, about 40 years forward, um, this is another uh, charcoal image. And it's about the same size as the one of Civil War George, done, I believe, by the same artist, um, partly because if you look at the hands, the hands are almost like spatulas. Um, the, the artist couldn't really do, oops, going the wrong way, couldn't really do hands. And if you can see the same thing in the picture of George, the hands were very poorly done. So because they both were in the local area. I, I think it's not unreasonable to think that the same artist did these. Um, so they're both charcoal. This was found in um, my uncle and aunt's basement, the Lushers in Woodstock by their grandson. I just have a question. question. Okay. Was it charcoal on paper? Is that what it was? Yeah, yeah. Well, almost a cardboard, it's sort of, yeah, yeah. Um, and he knew that I was interested in local history and in the family history, and so he gave this to me. He took it out of the frame, so I never saw if it was the same kind of frame. Um, it was damaged. He said the frame was badly damaged. Uh, again, I did, now I believe this is Horace. Um, and uh, George's brother, when I did research, he also enlisted um, in the war, and that was in 1861, about a year um, sooner than his brother. And he did not live long after uh, the war. He died in Concord, Vermont, which is over near St. Johnsbury, uh, of consumption. Yeah, yeah, it's a little tiny, tiny town um, right beyond St. Johnsbury. This is another um, family artifact, and this brought me closer, 
much closer to what I would discover about Lucy. Um, this is a New Testament that was owned by George and Horace's um, mother. And um, if you, I don't know if you can see it, but up in the far right, it said Betsy Gage's Bible, Lunenburg, Vermont, 1866. And it describes how, who owned it, and then ultimately um, it was given to my grandmother by her sister. But I, like I said, had never heard of Lunenburg, Vermont. I didn't have any idea where it was. And it was also 1866, which um, is right, you know, is right after um, the Civil War. So it was taking me way back into another period. This is Lunenburg. Um, it's, if you haven't been up there, I mean, it's, a, it's beautiful to be up there. It's near the uh, Connecticut River. Um, you can really, you can just feel the history up there. Um, this is the Congregational Church and the Town Hall. And to the right of the town hall is the road that once uh, went over to Victory, Vermont, which is a tiny, tiny, tiny little town kind of set in the bog. Um, a lot of people hunt there. It's, there's places where you can hike. Um, but that's where I got the name was um, Road to Victory, which is she lived on the Road to Victory. This family photo um, is to me the most beautiful, the most moving photograph that I have. Um, this is um, Myalina Larrabee Gage. She married Civil War George, so, um, and her sister, Melinda Larrabee. And Melinda Larrabee would marry um, Lucy's niece. Um, she would marry, I'm sorry, <laughs> you get all tangled up in this. Uh, Melinda married Lucy's son, Charles when she was 14 years old. Um, and that, again, that thread became a really important part of the book um, because of her age, because of um, her unwillingness to stay with him. Um, she, she left him, she came back, she left him, she came back. Um, and remember, this was all, um, they were married in 1861. Um, so this was a long time ago. That, so these were women who they took their lives to, as much as they could into their hands um, and did as much as they could um, to live um, lives that they wanted to live. Um, this picture, I have a, a cousin who has an, the exact same image, but hers wasn't in a frame. So on the back, there was a revenue stamp. And revenue stamps were um, used as money makers during the Civil War. And if you had, for different reasons, but if you had your picture taken, you had to buy a revenue stamp and that money went to support the war. Um, so that helped date this picture to 1862. Um, this, these are two marriage certificates. One is for Myalina and George, and one is for Melinda and Charles. And it, they were married um, a number of months apart. Um, it was almost like the sister got married and then the little sister decided, why not? I want to be married too. Um, but she was really young. She was 14. Um, and if you see on here, um, it refers to her as Melinda, the, the Presby, but it was crossed out. And then her Larrabee was written there because she was marrying her first cousin. So um, obviously the clerk um, got that mixed up. Uh, they were both married at their parents' house, uh, at the w girls' parents' house. Um, and just it was a small, as far as I can tell, it was just a really small wedding, and not a lot of people um, were there other than family. And this is Guildhall, which is um, a little bit um, north of Lunenburg. Uh, and it's a beautiful, again, it's a really beautiful town. Um, it, there's the courthouse you can see, um, which would be a later part, important part of the story involving Charles, involving David Beatty, um, for, uh, for what uh, David did, he destroyed all of um, Charles' sap making equipment. And so there's court records about that. Um, so that's, that's where Guildhall is. Um, following the thread of Charles, um, again, became something that was quite easy to do once you started to dig into it. 
I don't know if any of you have ever um, looked at pension files for Civil War area, era or other eras, but um, this is part of the pension file for Charles. And um, he was in Boot Station in Louisiana. Uh, he, was in an, he was part of a, a group of men guarding a railroad. And this was after the Union soldiers had taken over uh, New Orleans. So there were more soldiers that came in to try and protect the city, to try and protect the areas around it. And um, transportation was a really important part of that. Uh, so he was with a group of other men on one of the cars and they were ambushed um, by the Confederates. Um, and he was shot through his right shoulder in such a way that his arm was paralyzed. Um, it's not clear if it was always paralyzed. I mean, it's, it, it's, that part is not clear, but at the time um, it was, and it was enough to discharge him. It was his right arm. Um, so, and it says he was wholly disabled um, from obtaining his subsistence from manual labor. He was a farmer, so this is saying he was eligible um, for a pension. An another really great source of information um, that I found was newspapers. I mean, if you have access um, to old newspapers, this is from the Essex um, County Herald. Um, these newspapers are actually digitized online. Um, if you went into chroniclingamerica.com um, for Vermont, there's a lot of newspapers that are digitized and you can search. Um, so I searched for Charles and this letter uh, to the editor um, talked about exactly what happened during the ambush, um, exactly who was there and how it worked. Um, why it happened, um, and closes with a list of the men who were killed, the men who were wounded, and some of the men were taken prisoner. Um, and so you, if you think about imagining what it was like for mothers, for family, for people to read this, knowing all of these people and seeing your son's name there, um, and not really knowing exactly what had happened or what would happen or would he ever come back. Um, so it's, it's really powerful and the practice of doing this um, by captains, by different military people was a really crucial way of communicating with people during the war, with, the, with civilians during the war. Um, this is back to Lunenburg and this is the war memorial, you can see the church and the town hall, and um, Charles' name is listed on that, because he, that was the town that he um, <clears throat> enlisted through. This was just kind of fun. This was in 2011, and the Vermont Civil War hemlocks were up there <clears throat> doing some reenactments, and it was really wonderful because of how immersed I was in that time period to see soldiers there and um, to get a feel for that time in that way. And um, with the help of a cemetery commissioner in Lisbon, New Hampshire, which is slightly over the border from um, Lunenburg, it's not, not too far away, um, that's his Charles Grave. Um, he died in 1906. Then you kind of take another look, you, you go another layer into the story through the research and through photographs. This is Lucy E and her sister, Wealthy Rowena, and I'm descended through um, Wealthy Rowena. I did know Wealthy, her um, sister had the same name, only they called it Wealtha or Wealthy, but spelled differently. Um, you can see the likeness of these women. You can see their, the structure of their faces, their expressions, their, um, and you can certainly see in Lucy um, how tough she was. I mean, she was very determined. She was um, certainly not wealthy, but she was beautifully dressed. Um, she really made an effort for the photograph. And interestingly enough, um, both of these women switched their names around. Um, they, it seemed like at a time when they were trying to reinvent themselves, uh, they went, so Lucy E, her name was Emmeline. And then uh, with all the things, when all the, the real drama in her life started, she changed her name 
Uh, she switched things, so she became Lucy. And um, wealthy, her was, she was always known as Rowena, and she too, at a point in her life where she was trying to reinvent herself, um, she switched her names around as well. Place, as I've been saying all along, is really important in, in the book. Um, and going to these places, there's, there's no substitute for that. I mean, finding where these places are, going up into the countryside um, is amazing. I mean, what, one search we went, my husband and I went on, we, it was in Guildhall, and we were looking for the old farm site of uh, one of the gauges, and the person in the town clerk's office said, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, when this guy comes back from paying his taxes, you go out and ask him. So, so we did. We went out and told him what we were looking for, um, and he took us home. He said, follow me home, and he said, I'll take you out in my ATV. I know the area. There's nothing there because it's all been logged. But he said, I will, I'll take you up there. And we saw a bear, and you know, we, it was great. It was this sense of being in that place. Um, and that's the same with going um, up into Lunenburg. We, we figured out from old maps and deeds where her land was in Lunenburg. Um, and we went up there. Um, we, went, um, we went numerous times. You can actually follow the road if you had an ATV, you, which we didn't, but you could follow the road all the way over into Victory. Um, and we went at one point with a cousin who's more daring than I was, and she was sitting in the back seat saying, I know we can make it, I know we can make it, but we, we chickened out. We, just, we weren't too sure about you know, where were we going. Um, and this is what the road um, to Victory looks like now, coming out of Lunenburg. Um, this is the pond. Um, that was Im important in the story in the sense that there was um, a mill there, there was a lot of logging. Logging was a huge part of the economy, um, and it was, it was part of some of the, the bad blood that came out of um, people as well, because everybody wanted the same thing. They were all looking for that same level of prosperity through um, logging. Uh, this is another view. She loved the mountains. She, she, if you'll see in other pictures for Jefferson, she always sought out the mountains. Um, and I always imagine that that gave her strength, that gave her hope, gave her something to hang on to. This is coming back down from um, the road over to Victory, and you can see the back of the town hall in Lunenburg, and on the left is the Methodist Episcopal Church. Then, this part of the story is, I think, really what hooked me on writing about her and feeling like she needed to have her story told. That it was really, it, it felt like, in a weird way, it felt like it was my job, it was my duty to tell her story because of how much she suffered. Um, and so, going back to some newspapers, um, David Beatty of Lancaster was sentenced on Wednesday the 15th to 10 years in state prison for arson. And that's all it said. It, I mean, it didn't talk about, um, it didn't talk about what he had done. Um, but this again, and I'm not sure what, what came first, but I started looking in other places to find out about what he did. Um, there's a woman named Millie Knudsen who has a book called Hard Times in which she collected all kinds of information for New Hampshire um, about crimes. And he, David Beatty, um, she did put that information from the Concord Prison Register of Prisoners' Records. So it tells, um, interestingly enough, it tells he was 54, he was over six feet tall, tells his hair and eye color, his complexion. Uh, he was born in Washington, Vermont, which is um, over near Chelsea. Um, it tells where he was tried, and then it says his charge was burning a house but not whose house. So that became another, another level um, that interested me about what did he do, and burning a house is a lot more personal. Not that burning anything is a good idea, but burning a house is very, very personal. Um, and I became interested in, in arson and why people do that and what, what do they get out of that? What are they trying to express through that? Um, and he was sentenced, he was committed in 1871, 
served 10 years, um, and I'm, I, I mean, what I've read, I mean, the, the, prison, the prisons were really horrible. And he was 54, so he was, for that time period, was old. I mean, he certainly wasn't young, and he spent 10 years there. Um, he was released in 1880, and I know from census records that um, he uh, went to live with his, one of his daughters in Manchester, uh, New Hampshire, and died soon after. He died in April of 1881, so he didn't live um, very long after that, and he's buried in the Togus National Cemetery in Maine. Um, not under the, quite the right name, they flipped the, the, B, the D into a B. Oh. And please, if anybody has questions, um, please feel free to um, break in. Yeah, I have a question. He was released early? Uh, I, I don't think so. It says so. Yeah. Oh, oh, it does? One year. Oh, oh one year? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It looks like, yeah, he served a little less. Maybe he was sick at it. Um. And how can you have black eyes? Is such a thing as black yeah. eyes? Really dark. Really dark. Person. <laughs> oh. huh? Yeah. He's <clears throat> dark complexion. Black. And this is his pension file um, from his service in the Civil War. Um, again, it talks about he was injured in the war. He was a big man. He was working on building a stockade. Um, he collapsed, and it says that he was paralyzed. Um, he did, however, recover. We, and I know this because he was discharged, um, but then he reenlisted. Um, and he, you know, he was not young. He was, I think he was maybe 42. So um, he, that, that's what he did. I don't, you know. Um. Another um, document that was important in telling Lucy's story uh, was, I, I used a lot of deeds because her, she and her family um, bought and sold land all the time. That was just a that was something that they were constantly doing within these tight little areas. So it wasn't like they were moving across the state or that was within this little area. Um, and this was from 1868. Um, so this was prior to the house burning. Um, and it said that they mortgaged the farm for his bail. So he had done something else. <laughs> And it may be no surprise, um, but it didn't say um, it didn't say what he had done. Um, so, again, I did more digging um, and discovered um, through court records he actually he he and David Beatty. I mean, he and Charles. There was something going on between them. There was really bad blood between them. So by 1868. David and Lucy were married. Um, Charles eventually married his, um, the, second, the cousin, and, but there was bad blood between them. Whether it was because they, of gambling, um, of drinking, but there, there was bad blood there. And so um, what David did is he, he burned, uh, and he burned all of the sap buckets. He, he destroyed the metal cauldrons. He, he just he got rid of all of that. And at a time of year when um, Charles had no time to make that, again, he couldn't, you know, that was sort of his, his whole setup to make maple sugar. And that was a big source of income. So that was a, a really horrible thing to have happen um, to, for people who didn't have a lot of money. You, you didn't just go out and say, okay, I'll take a whole new setup. Of, to, yeah, yeah. Um, because of the fact that um, they had mortgaged the farm for the bail, um, but David didn't show up for the court date. Um, so that then would forfeit the money, the bail money. So he was gone. She didn't know where he was. And so he, she then owed the money. Um, she had moved, um, she had moved over into Jefferson. So after all this went on, um, she moved into Jefferson. So she, she had, and she was obviously crafty. She got out of Lunenburg. 
where there was trouble, she went to Jefferson, um, she bought another farm, and then she said she put herself on the mercy of the court and said, you know, please don't hold me responsible for this. And, and this court document, um, is, it's, it's painful. It's really painful. It, it's painful that she, of what she went through, of what she was trying to do. Um, and I will read you a little bit about this. This was from March 1869. I, Lucy E. Beattie of Jefferson, Coss County, New Hampshire, on oath to pose and say that I am the wife of one David Beattie, who is indicted in Essex County, Vermont, for maliciously destroying property that I was married to him in 1866, and he then had no property whatsoever. I had a small place in Lunenburg, Essex County, Vermont, on which we lived till the summer of 1868. My husband did most of the work on the place at first, but soon got in a bad way and would sell the grain and crops and spend the money in drinking, and I was obliged to make baskets and work out to support myself and two children by my former husband. At the time my husband was accused, I procured counsel for him at my own expense, and when he was held to bail as he could find no one to bail him, I mortgaged my farm to Mr. Stone to secure him as bail. Some few months after I did this, and just before the September time of court in Essex County, my husband used me very ill. He beat me and pounded me and said he would kill me, and one day after using me in this way, he left and I have not seen or heard where he is since, except by way of the letter I had today. So she, she had really suffered. I mean, she, women didn't have a lot of authority. They didn't have a lot of backup. Um, there was no safety net. Um, if you, you could rely on your family if you were lucky, but basically the husband ruled. He ruled the, the land. Um, she didn't have a right. She did as much as she could. But ultimately, um, he had the authority. She took it upon herself to be the wife she felt she needed to be. Um, she hired counsel. Um, she tried to, but she said, okay, I can't, I can't do it. Please don't make me do this because I'll lose what I have. Um, this is where she went after she left um, Lunenburg. She went to Jefferson, New Hampshire. And again, she loved the mountains. Um, this is the view from her last house with David Beatty. Um, and mm. she went, she let him come back. So mm. she moved um, and then she let him come back. So in 1870 census, um, they were living together along with her daughter Fanny and one of his sons. Um, so. Um, for everything that had happened, she, I don't know, she forgave him, but she was his wife. Um, so she let him, let him come back to live with her. Um, this is uh, the house, I believe, was the one next door to Lucy's. Uh, apparently, uh, the house that she and David lived in um, is gone now. Um, I did meet up. Uh, one of the things that in the research that was really fun was meeting some family people. Um, and one of the people I met, her name was Mary, uh, and she was descended through uh, Lucy's line. And so she had um, pictures. She remembered going to that house as a little girl. She didn't remember Lucy, but she remembered um, Lucy's son. And, um, and this house uh, is no longer there. It was must have been in really bad shape, and it was burned by the Jefferson, New Hampshire um, Fire Department. And this is her daughter, um, who looks, looks really like life was really hard for her. And if you think about one of the things that I thought about um, for the book was the fact that she was a young girl when her father died, and then her mother met David and married this man who was really horrible, there was a horrible life situation. Um, and she must have taken it, I mean, she must have worn that. She wore that as a, as a burden. Um, she was, I think, maybe 12 or 13 when her father died. So, you know, she was a young, she was a young girl, became a young woman um, under those circumstances. Uh, and there's another picture of her 
uh, with her children, William and Emma. And this picture is William as an old man. Um, and I like that sense that you're, you're seeing people moving through time, that you, know, you see the little kid and then you see um, the old man. And um, This is the view from Lucy's last home, which is the house I showed you that um, I said had been burned. So she did have the mountains. This is um, a picture looking again at those mountains. This is from the 1940s, and you can see the barn and the milk house. Uh, no nothing of that is, uh, is there. So and this was her great-grandson, yeah, who had been fishing. Um, and Lucy um, is buried next to that house. There's no, um, there's no stone there. Um, you can see the posts, and there's four, four posts around that. Her daughter Fanny and some other people, a few other people are buried there, but there's no, you know, there's no stone there. Um, and finally, um, but the obituary for Lucy, she died in 1896, was in one of the papers, talked about um, how she died at her daughter's house and talked about where she was buried. Um, she said the, in the field back of the house near the woods. So. And I'd like to I'll read you one short piece about her and uh, David. I knew there was trouble brewing when I awoke and he was not in bed beside me where he had collapsed in the early morning hours. I crept down the stairs, listening cautiously to the silence of the house for any sound that might show me where he was and what he was up to. There was nothing much, only a whisper of something from the kitchen, like paper against paper. I stopped, though, hardly breathing. I had avoided the spots on the treads that made the most noise, but I knew my descent had been far from soundless. If he were in the kitchen, he had already heard me. Indeed, I expected he had been waiting for me, and if I did not come in now, he would come in search of me, and that would be worse. I only wished I had warned Fanny to stay in her room until she knew it was safe to come down. He was sitting at the table, ramrod straight, and facing the door from which he knew I would enter. The stairs went up from the front door, and at their base was also the door to the parlor and a narrow passageway, too narrow to be called a hall, that led to the kitchen. When I went in, my hands knotted at my sides. There he was in the dim light of pre-dawn. I could see the shadowy lines of his face and his dark eyes like smudges of soot with no reflection of light. In his fingers was a slip of paper, and it was that I had heard as he had twisted it in his agitation so it rubbed against itself with a rustling sound like a mouse in the wall. As soon as I was in the room, he began to speak, his voice low and full of menace. This is what it has come to. I am man of this house, and I sit alone in my kitchen with no one tending me or even pretending to care. I am wearing the same clothes I had on last night, and no one even helped me out of them. Where is my wife? Have you seen her? Because I have no wife here. A wife would have waited up for me and helped me out of my clothes, whatever hour or condition I came home. Here I am, sitting here. Is there any hot water for me to wash my face or shave? Is there any coffee made? Is there even the beginnings of breakfast before I start my day? He paused to gulp air. Do you see what I have in my hand? He snarled at me. He thrust out the paper at me, but I stayed put, my mind racing at how I might escape. This is a note, Mrs. Businesswoman. Do you know what this means? I am in debt. This time to that fat bastard over in Lancaster who owns the grist mill. And how am I to pay it? You tell me there's no money. I own this farm and have a wife, but how am I to pay this debt? So nice guy. <laughs> um, and before I uh, take some questions, I wanted to mention that um, I am working on another book. Um, and let me, this is about Charles, um, who, as I discovered, also had a lot of um, an interesting history and who ended up um, as part of a court case that ended up in the Supreme Court over whether or not um, his wife had had the right to sell property. Um, the question was, then, but then the other side said, were, they, were you even married? Um, so it, it was, I, I have a lot of court records about that.
When was that case? Uh, that was in 1884, 85. Yeah. yeah. And how did the Supreme Court rule? Um, they ruled in his favor. In his favor. <laughs> in his favor. Yeah, the local court ruled in his favor that she had had no right um, to sell the land. Um, and then it went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled that, um, indeed, she had no right to sell. That, that they were, they were um, married um, by common law. common law, right? Not by, not by law itself, but by, yeah, by fact, by the fact they had six children and yeah. <laughs> had been together for a long time. <laughs> so any, any questions? Did she have any better luck on the marriages to come? <laughs> no, I mean, she did, she did not. I think she made choices based on, uh, or maybe because she owned land, like at least one of the men had no land. So, um, and it, he, he didn't live long. It sounded like he didn't have very good health. He couldn't read or write. Um, she, then she married uh, another man who, um, they, the, all the men she married after that tended to be a lot younger. Um, the, her fourth husband was about 20 years younger than she was, um, and he could read and write. He, he did own property himself, um, but all to, I mean, uh, what I know about him was from a newspaper article after they, they were no longer a couple, um, but he, he couldn't hear, he'd been injured, um, in the Civil War, so he was very, very deaf, and his house caught on fire, and the neighbor saw it on fire and didn't do anything about it. Um, so he burned to death oh, in the house. So I'm assuming maybe he, he wasn't somebody that, uh, at least that neighbor didn't want us to yeah. want to see him. Yeah. Yeah. How do you think she supported herself? Um, well, I think she always, she always had a farm, so she always had land. She probably, I mean, I would guess she probably had a garden. She had chickens. She, and then the one document said she uh, made baskets and did some kind of work out, but it didn't yeah. say, didn't say oh, what. Yeah. yeah. And then, I mean, when her, when her son was living there, and, I mean, Maple Sugaring did bring in um, some money, certainly. You had done a lot of research and visited places, but like, what did you do to kind of get in character for her voice? Mm -hmm. it, it felt like once I started writing, I did probably six or seven years of research, and once I was ready to write, it fe I, I, wouldn't, I don't mean that I channeled her, but I knew what she sounded like. I mean, I just really knew like her story was just right there to be told. It felt like, it felt like something I needed to do, and... And there, there the words were. And I had originally I had wanted to um, write nonfiction, but there wasn't really enough uh, material there. So I think actually I was talking to Howard Coffin, and he said, "Write a novel." It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> were you like novel. haunted by her? No, her? no. It felt more like like I was doing something for her okay. that um, needed to be done. Like that, that was a story that um, needed to be told. Redemption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This reminds me of the beginning of the Rockefeller family about the same period, in which the, the Rockefeller who runs Shelburne Farm or Museum up there, she has written about that. Oh. Huh. And the original John D. Senior, the original Rockefeller, was 15 when he was in charge of running the family huh. because his father just vamoosed, oh, and they had five huh. children. Huh. And uh, so, yeah, he just left. Yeah, and, yeah, and people, somebody that was had upstate, to step up. That was in upstate New York. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. And that same rural yeah. kind of conditions. And, yeah. Yeah. And, and Elizabeth Warren, uh, mother had to work to uh, keep the mortgage going huh. and she got a job at Sears luckily enough. Yeah I mean I've talked to I talked to a woman who's um, a, a little bit older than I am and her father died when she was young and um, she was pretty much raised by I think by her grandmother um, there was no social security there, were, there was nothing so her mother worked all the time um, to bring in money to take care of the kids but she couldn't 
raise the kids. She could just, you know, she didn't have time from her work to um, really be Help responsible. <laughs> Any other questions? It seems to me she was telling herself the whole way, you must endure. And she did that. Yeah. So where did she get that? I, I think she was, a, she was a really strong woman. And, and I think she, um, she had a goal. Her, I think her goal was to have her own property and to be prosperous. Because her father, uh, although not particularly successful, always bought and sold land. Um, and I think she wanted to do that. Um, despite the fact that she was a woman, it was almost like she, she knew she had to have a man, um, but she thought she could just do it on her own, and she kept trying to do that. I mean, even at the very end, the house, I, the red house I showed you where she died, um, I found she, she sold that property to her daughter for $500. She didn't give it to her. She sold it, and it had conditions. The conditions were that she had a specific room in the house that was hers, and she had the right to use the carriage and the horse and as she wanted to. So she was bargaining all the time. It wasn't like, oh, daughter, you're going to take care of me. You can have the house. Mm -mm, no, no, she wasn't like that. So, yes, yeah, you're right. She did. She really, she endured. Well, thank you. That was quite a tale. You're welcome. Cassie has books up here for sale if anybody liked a little light reading for tonight. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Cheery topics. <laughs>